enjoying La Console. I hope you're not too exhausted and you've been enriched by the variety of guests that we've had. I, I don't think I'd be offending anyone by saying we have saved the best until last. He is a man who has achieved extraordinary things in horse racing, both sides of the Atlantic. He had a, a successful riding career until 1980 when he took over his parents' training base, from where he sent out the first five home in the Gold Cup in 1983, a dual Gold Cup winning trainer, many other great races as well, including several editions of the King George VI steeplechase. After a brief period training uh, at Manson for Robert Sangster, he relocated to the United States, where he instantly became a great one winning trainer several times over. His most famous accomplishment in the United States was to get the injured De Hoss back to the track to win a second Breeders' Cup mile two years after his first. Subsequent to which, if that wasn't enough, he decided to climb another mountain, and that was to try and revolutionise the way in which horses are trained and the surface on which they run. He is none other than Michael Dickinson. Michael, good morning. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to chat. Not at all, and it is great to see you here, and I've thoroughly enjoyed seeing you before the programme with Henrietta Knight and David Sykes, good old friends of yours as well, and just your enthusiasm, your relentless enthusiasm for every aspect of the game is quite infectious. I often ask trainers, people and practitioners in the game, do you ever get bored? You clearly never get bored. No, no, I love horses, love racing. So, yes, it's my life. It has been your life right from the outset. Um, when you were riding horses for your, for your parents, when they were training very successfully, it strikes me that there was almost a happy-go-lucky quality to, to, to the game relative yeah. to what it is now. Yes, we hear all the time now about the jockeys at Cheltenham. There's so much pressure on them coming to Cheltenham because Cheltenham's so big and powerful now. They've got to have a winner and they're under pressure. Well, I was never under that pressure because we were, at the time, just farmers from Yorkshire with its fox hunting and point to points. So just to have a runner with a sort of 10 to 1 chance at Cheltenham was fantastic. So when I walked in the racetrack at Cheltenham, I already felt a winner. Mm. I felt no pressure to win. We weren't expected to win at Cheltenham. So I used to just go out and enjoy myself. So that was terrific to be in that position. And do you think that was redolent of the whole atmosphere around national hunt racing then? Was um, it a, a rather more relaxed scene, well, it, do you it, think? It, uh, it, yes, I mean, Cheltenham's got bigger since then, but uh, no, it was always the number one, and we always wanted to do it, so it was, for me, just to have a runner. So I really enjoyed it. And you, you never miss it, do you? You're always back there for Cheltenham every Yes, year. yes, we go, yes. And uh, now I've, uh, I'm a self-appointed ambassador, and I invite people from outside racing and bring them racing. Mm. So two years ago, we bought Carol Borderman and Richard Mindy Hammond, and now they've put a horse in training with Tim Bailey. So that's good. This year we've got quite a few. We've got the, uh, the head of NASA coming. Have you? Yes. And we've got... Uh, how, dare I ask, how do, you, how do you go about becoming friends with the head of NASA? Where did, where did that come from? Uh, well, she's been to stay at the farm. Uh -huh. um, she's the head of the, uh, um, the NASA base near Washington, D.C. Right. So she comes up and we took her fox hunting because she rides horses. She likes horses. She's a big friend of Carol Boardman, so Carol bought her. But right. she's great. So she's the head of NASA, NASA yes. Washington, of course, your base is in, in Maryland, so, so not too far away. Uh, just tell me, when, when you transitioned from, from being a rider to training, to taking over the, the training of the horses, was it immediately obvious to you that you could, you could make a breakthrough, you could take a step forward as regards no. conditioning horses or not, or no, did, it, no, did it just no, happen? No, uh, my father very kindly retired when he was quite young and gave me the chance, and the first year we didn't do very well, we messed it up. So I sat down with Brian Powell, our head man, who's now at Godolphin, and I said, well, we've got to do better. So we, we started training them differently. So it was Brian and I, perhaps, to, to get them fitter. What happened? I was out for dinner with Michael Stout uh, during the Commonwealth Games when they were breaking all the records. So Stout he said to me, wouldn't that be great to know how they break all these records? Mm. So I said, well, let's do it. So I arranged some meetings with the head coach and the head doctor from the British Olympic team and also with uh, Stan Long who was the coach for Brendan Foster. Mm -hmm. So we had about 10 lessons together. Stouty came up from Newmarket and we went to visit them all. And that year I won the Cheltenham Gold Cup and Stouty won the derby with Shergar. This was 81? 81. 81, that's when we started, yes. So my first season wasn't very good and uh, second season was a bit better. And this is because you had engaged people who were experts in athletic performance yes, to come and yes, help you. So yes. what was it that they were telling you to do? Uh, just you more, just uh, more work, yes. Um, 
I think that we, they did a canter for about five furlongs, and Stan Long came down, he, you know, we invited him down. He said, well, we haven't taken our track suits off yet. <laughs> and, uh, and we thought that was quite, a, quite a, enough training, you know. But you'd been steeped in, your family had been steeped in the training of racehorses yes, for, yes. for so many years. You must have thought, well, we know exactly how to, to do this. Well, how frightened were you of pushing these horses further than, uh, further than you thought was, was, was realistically oh, possible? Well, my dad did. Yeah, I bet. Yes, he came into when we started doing, and uh, if it hadn't been for Brian, I wouldn't have had the confidence to do it. But he came into my office, closed the door behind him, stuck behind the door so I couldn't get out. You've got to stop. This isn't going to work. You've got to stop. So I said, please, Dad, let me go on. And he did. He was great. But uh, not after a, a discussion or two. And the impact was, was pretty extraordinary. What sort of reaction do you think you got from your contemporaries, your peers, other trainers at the time to the success that you were having? You'll have to ask them that. There was a degree of, there was a degree of envy, I would imagine, that well, you'd gone from. Friend, so, yes. Yep. And but we had some good horses, and we had, had some, some good staff. You had some brilliant horses. And we only had 55 stables, and we had uh, 17 boys, and they'd all ridden winners. So we had a great team, so we had a lot of help. There was well, a lot of things. How, how was that possible then? Because you, you listen to trainers now, and they say, I can't get the staff, I can't get the riders to come in and school. The idea of having that many jockeys who'd had a license and ridden winners to yes. ride for you on a daily basis when you only had 55 horses, it sounds like training utopia, and you could make a living. Uh, well, we couldn't really make a living. We didn't make any money training. Even that year when we had the first five and we won three races at Cheltenham, we didn't make any money. But we had some good boys and it was very rewarding to see them. Earnshaw joined me from school and Bradley just joined me for one year after school. So they both went on to win the Gold Cup. But we had a good team. Who was the best jockey you rode for you? Oh, they're all good. That's a, that's a leading question. That. It's not a leading question. It's no, just a question. All, it's a, it might be a horrible question, but no, it's no, no. They're, they're all good. Yes, had some good boys. Um, when you had the first five home in the in the Gold Cup, it must have been a an extraordinary but bizarre day for you to experience. Yes, it wasn't. I wasn't happy. Um, I'd been under a lot of pressure for a long time. At Christmas, they were all in really good shape. All the horses, everything. We had twelve winners on Boxing Day. We only had 20 runners, mm -hmm. and they're all in the first three bar one. Mm -hmm. So everything was going well, and then the next day, we had four runners, and they all ran terrible. So we went down. So from uh, January and February, nothing went right. And I said to Brian, in the middle of February, I said, Brian, I said, last year we were first and second in the Gold Cup, and this year we're not going to have a runner. That was how it was in February. I know, we just managed to get them all right in the time. It wasn't enjoyable for me because Silverbuck and Wayward Lad were the two best horses there, but they weren't at their best. So I hated doing that, running them, when I knew they weren't at their best. Um, I'm not proud of that now. But um, So if you, yeah. had, if you had your time again, you wouldn't, wouldn't have run them? No, I probably would have done, but you, d you don't like doing it. You know, when you know they're not at their best, but Wayward Lad Rad... They were sound and they were healthy. But Wayward Lad was third and Silverbuck was fourth, so they can't have been that bad. But it was a worry to me. Was Wayward Lad the most talented horse you trained? No, Bad's a boy. By a long way. Three Queen Mother Champion chases. Yes, but his first year he won by 35 lengths. The horses that won 102 races um, to beat two previous winners of the race. And was he a horse that when you when you worked him when you did anything with him at home was far in advance of all the other talented horses in your string was he the clear star the clear standard no 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 not no no not not really this is him winning his third his queen third. mother championship yes. well, in 1984 he was i think my mother trained him this year didn't she it's probably my mother what was it that set him apart michael oh well, he had a lot of speed and he was very fast over his fences. Robert Earnshaw was as good a rider as has ever been over a fence. He's not the best jockey in the world, but he was brilliant. He used to go in lengths in the air. So he was... And he was the best horse you trained? Yes, definitely, yes. Uh, do you think How often do you win a championship race by 35 lengths? Do you think he's the best two-miler there's ever been? Because there was the pole in the race yes, in first no, the week. Yes, no, Flying Bolt was the best. He was yeah. the second best. Now, I know... Um, what's the horse that won the race? That won the competition? Uh, did Sprinter Sacre come yes, out Sprinter one Sacre, in the year? Yes, Well, he was a very good horse, but he only won two champion two-mile chases. He only won by 19 lengths. 
why it, a, he won because it was recent and because it was very emotional because mm. for two years one year he didn't show up mm. and the other year he was fourth so it was a brilliant training job by Nicky so it was more the emotion because there's a guy who lost his crown and won it back again mm -hmm. but it wasn't you know in no I think the, the time he won his first champion chase he was up there yes he was with, up there yes with, with Badsworth Boy and Flying Bolt but, but I mean not the same you know thing. two years he was missing in action now I know that uh, you are much prouder of other achievements than, than the first five home in the Gold Cup. Why, why does de Haas winning his second Breeders' Cup mile mean so much more to you than everything you achieved <coughs> under National Hunt? Because uh, we were certain he was going to win before the race. Um, had a really good team, Miguel Piedra and Joan Wakefield and John Boy Faraday. John Boy used to ride his work, to get his work within a fifth of a second in a minute's work. He was very good. But we knew we had him spot on. And I went to see Johnny Velasquez in the morning of the race. And I said, I know you've got six rides today, but you're going to have one winner. And I was almost crying, you know, because we just knew he was so well. So we trained him really well, unlike the Gold Cup, when I only trained three out of the five very well. So he'd had, he'd had a very unorthodox preparation, even by European standards, but particularly by American standards, where they are really not used to a massive layoff and then one prep run and then bang. Yes, but they don't have to race. Peter Farm to train on. Indeed not. If you show them the pictures of Peter Farm, it's just way above the facilities on an American dirt track. It's very hard to train a turf horse on an American dirt track. How could you be so confident that he was going to win? Oh, because he worked really well. We did interval training with him. He was spot on. And I had the three people who trained him, really. It was Miguel, who was his groom, mm -hmm. who... No. Six weeks before, well, first of all, he'd won the Breeders' Cup. Then we were training him in South Carolina, mm -hmm. and he bowed attended. So he was off for a year. So we brought him back. And in June, and I uh, called up the owners, and I said, I'm sorry, I need more time with him. Well, he'd already had 18 months, and the owners were great. I said, I need more time. Just give me more time. I'll give him one race before the Breeders' Cup, and we'll win the Breeders' Cup. So they weren't too pleased, <laughs> having not seen you for 18 months. I bet. Yes. So you were piling a fair bit of pressure on yourself. Yes. Adopting that campaign. Well, I was confident. Yeah. So, and then six weeks before, two vets came and said, he's not going to make the first race, let alone the second. You should retire him. Mm -hmm. And 99 times out of 100, they would have been right. But Miguel, who looked after him, came to me and said, don't worry, we'll get him there. And he had the magic hands and he, he, he worked really hard on him. He used to stand him in ice twice a day, but he did all sorts of other things. And John Boy rode him well, he always knew when he was right. John Boy says they're right, they're right. And Joan trained him m as much as I did. And they were, we were very confident. He was fit, he was sound, and he'd been better than he was the year before. So Gary Stevens got off him. So we saw Gary Stevens three days before, and all my staff went up to Gary. You made a big mistake, Gary. You got off. So, because um, I booked Gary on January the 1st, February the 1st, March the 1st, the 1st of every month, I call him up. You will ride the horse in the Breeders' Cup at the end of the year, yet, yeah, just to his agent. So I call up in October, said, Ron Anderson, his agent, mm -hmm. said, uh, you will ride my horse. No, we're not riding you. I said, well, I booked you. We're not riding, we're riding Among Men for Michael Stout. Yeah. I said, Among Men? <laughs> You're not joking. <laughs> among Men? So I'll bet you a thousand dollars now. Um, wherever they finish, first and second, or next to last, last and next to last, we'll finish in front of um, Among Men. So he took me on. But that was easy money. That was easy money. Now, before you went out, it, that day in 98 to win the yes. second of your two Breeders' Cup miles. You had some worries about the turf course, didn't you? And it was, that, was that the day you, you famously wore a... Well, you can tell the story. No, that was at Woodbine. Actually. Woodbine. This was yes. 96 when he won yes, the first Woodbine. time. Right, so Joan went up early with the horse. And every night she phoned me, it's raining. It's mm -hmm. raining. I said, I don't want to hear that. Because he wanted so, fast ground. He wanted fast ground, yes. So, anyhow, a... Um, so I got there on the Wednesday. I said, well, let's walk the course. So I was with a pentrometer. John Boy had a stick, and Joan was there. And we thought there was a, a dry patch. I said, well, we've got Gary Stevens riding for us. 
and he's, you know, won the Kentucky Derby three times, and I'm a farmer from Maryland, so why is he going to take any notice of us? So if we tell him something, we better make damn sure that it's right. Mm. So going back, I was dating a model when I was riding, and she came to Chepstow, but she had a cocktail dress and high heels on, which is not where you go to Chepstow in March, anyhow. So bless her, she walked round with me with high heels, mm -hmm. and I said, I'm going to come up the left-hand side. Oh, she said, no go up the right, my heels something a lot less. So then I knew by accident, the best way to test a racetrack is with a lady with high heels. So fast forward 20 years later, Joan's there, and I said, Joan, go and get some high heels. So she goes to the local shoe barn or whatever it was and gets some fairly cheap high bright red high heels. So she walked around with us. Anyhow, we found a, um, a dry, two dry patches on there, but we walked around three times, so it was nine laps between us. So we found the dryer patch, so we went to Gary, I said, now this is, you know, if you do this, you will not win. But if you do this, you might win. This is one of the best systems of all time, and all the science <laughs> you've applied to the training of racehorses as well. So why did you move to America, Michael? Because uh, uh, Robert Sanks fired me. So I lost, I lost a job, it wasn't the end of the world, but I'd lost my reputation. And I wanted to, I could have gone back jumping, but I wanted mm -hmm. to prove myself on the flat. So uh, Dr. Lambert, who was uh, uh, an American vet with us, and he said, well, you've had a tough time, these horses... Is it da David Lambert? David Lambert, yeah. yes. You've had a tough time um, with these horses that were very backward. And um, uh, so he said, come to America and I'll send you 12 horses. And you felt that your reputation was so sufficiently crushed by the time oh, of yes, Manson yes, yes. that we, you, could never, you couldn't have rescued no, yourself here? No, with 40 horses. And, we'd only, and I got fired in December, so it was after the yearling sales. So David took us to America, we loved America, and it's the best thing that's ever happened to us. You know, we've been really happy in America, we've been there 30 years. And, um, do, you, yes. do, you, do, do you feel more, do you feel more accepted in America? Do you think there's a, a, a great openness to people who do things a bit differently, or are... No, I think both sides of the Atlantic, they think I'm a pain in the ass. <laughs> But do you think there's more place for a pain in the in the backside there than there is here? No, it's it's equal. People are the same in the world over. Most people are nice. You always get one or two percent who aren't so nice. But wherever you go. And so, how quickly did you pick up the thread and get things rolling? There? Our first winner won by eleven lengths. And then you were away. And then we're away. Yes. No, we've enjoyed America. And tell me the story of the place over your shoulder, which is to Peter Farm. Peter Farm. Okay, so. We'd been training at Fairhill on a dirt track and a wood chip track. Mm -hmm. And I always wanted to build a Bally Doyle. As you know, I spent two summers with Vincent O'Brien. Yeah. So I always wanted to build a Bally Doyle. Um, so I knew if I was training on a farm, I had to have a really good surface, better than anyone else. So there it is. So it took me four years to come up with that. So um, how, did you, how did you create this surface? Um, well, it took me four years and 53 different samples, failed samples, before I got... So did you lay 53 different gallops? No, no, just samples in boxes and right. what have you, yes. But how did you know that the horses would go well on that um, particular... You got a feel for it, yes, right. yes, yep. So there's the farm, it's 195 acres on the Chesapeake Bay, and it's halfway between Washington and New York, and it's a beautiful farm, and uh, we're very happy there. So I mean, Incredibly well positioned for all the... All the race tracks, tracks. On the yes, Eastern yeah, no, it's great. And yes. what, what can you do there that you can't do elsewhere? Well, we've got hills, mm -hmm. we've got six turf tracks, two Tapita tracks, and the big thing is we've got 50 acres of turnout. We love turning the fillies out, and they love going out. So you essentially are trying to apply well, what you would call European methods to exactly, American horse racing. Exactly. All it is is a copy of Ballet Doyle. We had Before I bought the farm, I had Johnny Brabston, who was Vincent the Bryan's head man, to come and see the farm. I said, can I make this into Bally Doyle? And he said, yes. And he came the first three years, so he helped me build it. Johnny Brabson used to ride Nijinsky. Mm -hmm. And um, he helped me with it all. He was, he, he was great. He had brilliant simplicity. He was a simple person, but he was brilliant. So I look at these pictures here, and I hear of your record, and I hear what you did with De Haas. And I'm sitting here thinking, why isn't Michael Dickinson trading a grade one winner every week in the United States nowadays? Why, why, that, surely that's what you should be doing. Well, when we, moved, we didn't win any grade ones at Fairhill, but when we moved to the farm, mm -hmm. we won eight grade ones in eight years. So that was okay with 40 horses, and mm -hmm. not too expensive. So that was okay. But then my wife wanted to take tapita footings around the world. And now we don't make tapita, she makes tapita 10. 
because she didn't think I did a good enough job. And she had 300 new samples, mm -hmm. and, and we've got 20, sorry, 10 improvements. So she told Peter to that's down at Newcastle. So she wanted to take to Peter around the world, and she wanted me to come with her. Right. So she'd helped me a lot in the training. And it was time to uh, repay uh, her. Repay her. And, and it was a good break, and I really enjoyed it, because I wanted to travel the world, and now I travel the world working. Right, are you, so, are you back in the game then now? Are you back well, in the game of training big, big race winners? Are we going to see another chapter to the Michael Dickinson right, well, training just, story? Uh, no. I've just got 12 horses for 12 friends. George Strawbridge, yep. who you know, gentleman. He's got a few nice ones. Yes, Mrs. Brody, who a big breeder from New York. Mm -hmm. And Chuck Pipke owns a diamond mine. He, he has got some nice ones. Yes. So I just trained for them, and they're great. So I don't want lots of horses, but you say, you know, yeah, you can't take the country out of the, I uh, just, out of the man. I just love training horses, and it's just great to train 12. And there's, it, it's, not, it's not impossible, though, that you'll land on another nice one. Oh, exactly. I know we will do. We will do, yes. I mean, you could we be, only got you... 12. But l last year we only had nine winners and 12 horses, but we had five horses that had black type. So mm -hmm. five out of 12 to get black type was all right. I rest my case. Yeah, well, yes.